you all for coming. My name is Patina Warner. I'm a, a dietitian here at McConnell. I've been here for many years working in a variety of programs. So I'm really excited to talk with you today about some of the nutrition considerations to think about um, with Parkinson's. These are some of the talks that we'll be covering today. We want to look at food medication interactions, certainly. Also, some issues that we can see sometimes with gastrointestinal motility slowing down, so constipation can be the result. We want to look at making sure that you're staying adequately hydrated, so that certainly can be an issue too. Bone health, which sometimes people don't think about that with Parkinson's, so we'll talk about some considerations around that. And then um, also weight management, so either weight loss or weight gain. It can mean either one of those things. And then we'll also look at some research topics that are being kind of considered too. So starting off with food medication interactions, what we're looking at here is interactions with um, levodopa and actually protein absorption. So um, levodopa is given in medications such as Cinnamet, that's one example. <coughs> what levodopa does is sometimes it can kind of compete with protein for absorption within the small intestine. So we have to think about when um, we're having a meal in this medication, what kind of meal do we want to have, or if it's a snack, what kind of snacks we want to have. Normally, uh, levodopa would be recommended to take with food because it can cause nausea otherwise. Either we want to cut down on the amount of protein that we're taking, that we're eating when we're taking this medication, or maybe we take the medication 30 to 60 minutes either before or after a meal to help with that. So just to look at some of the sources of protein, Protein is found in most of our foods, but in very small amounts in foods such as fruits and vegetables and grains. Some whole grains um, have a little more protein than others. Really our main sources of protein are um, our animal foods. So things like eggs, beef, poultry, so chicken and turkey, pork, dairy foods, milk, yogurt, cheese, fish, and a variety of seafood options. And then also even plant-based protein like soy product, tofu, soy milk, soybeans, all of these foods have quite a bit of protein in them. We recommend having about six to eight ounces of foods such as meat, fish, poultry, and eggs throughout the day. Generally, that's a, a kind of a standard recommendation. And we like to see food spread out throughout the day kind of evenly into even portions just for good health, um, protein the same way just so that our bodies can utilize that the best if we're breaking that down. If you see the illustration in the corner of the screen there, what we're showing is, do you know, any, does anyone know what we're showing with that, with a deck of cards? Yeah, a deck of cards would be equal about three ounces of proteins. You see that the chicken looks a little bigger than that deck of cards, but it's also probably a little more thin too. So that thickness, about an inch thick in a deck of cards would be about three ounces of protein. So that's a pretty good amount of protein to have, you know, at your meal. A lot of people ask us, how much protein should I have in a day? What is right for me? Our recommendation is to have about, um, take your body weight and divide that by two. That's how many grams of protein you should have in one day. So a person who is 200 pounds, if you divide by two, that would be about 100 grams of protein. A person who is 150 pounds divided by two, that'd be about 75 grams of protein. So that's just kind of a general recommendation for that. And to give you an idea, this three ounce portion of chicken would have about 21 grams of protein. So having 20 to 28 grams of protein at a meal and maybe a little protein um, at your snack time too between meals if you're hungry. Um, we just want to kind of spread that out. So these are the types of foods though that when we're talking about levodopa and how that can um, sort of compete with protein for digestion, um, for absorption and rather into the small intestine, these are the kind of things that we want to kind of be careful about. So because we don't want to take the medication necessarily on an empty stomach, we want to have low protein foods. So not those high protein foods with that medication, but some alternate foods such as maybe some fruit or vegetables or grains like cereals, breads, crackers. So an example might be having a piece of fruit or orange juice with a slice of toast or some crackers, especially if you're taking that medication before a meal, rather than just having it on an empty stomach, it can be helpful to have a little bit of something like this to go along with that medication and reduce that chance of having nausea. When we think about constipation, a lot of people don't really know what that even means exactly. Well, what was the actual definition for that? That means that we're having fewer than three bowel movements in a week. That would be considered constipation. So sometimes with Parkinson's, our gastrointestinal tract, the motility can be impaired a little bit. There can be some degeneration of the nerves of the GI tract with the Parkinson's, and that can cause us not to be able to move food through as efficiently as maybe we once could. And then certain medication used to treat Parkinson's also can cause some of this constipation. 
constipation, and even just not having enough fiber or enough water in our diet. So that could affect you know, a lot of people, and so we're always talking about making sure to get enough fiber in the diet and enough water in the diet as well. Our recommendation for fiber is to have at least 25 grams a day. A lot of times people don't like to count up how many grams of this and grams of that that they have, so we talk about what kind of foods are high in fiber just to make sure that you're eating a variety of those foods. When we increase fiber in the diet though, we do want to increase water along with that to make sure that the, the food is able to move through efficiently. So, and we want to do that gradually. If we're not eating much fiber and then all of a sudden we start eating a lot more fiber, um, sometimes that can cause us to have sort of an upset stomach or some irritation. We just want to kind of gradually increase that fiber in that water. Fiber helps to soak up water and add bulk to our stool. It also helps to exercise the muscles of the intestine so that they work you know, better for a longer period of time. Sources of fiber, these are going to be our plant-based foods. Things like our fruits and our vegetables, especially keeping those skins on. So eating the skin, washing them well, and eating the skin gives us even more fiber and more nutrition. Also beans, things like our black beans, kidney beans, pinto beans, garbanzo beans, lentils, all of those are very high in fiber. So um, we recommend this for a variety of reasons, even heart health, you know, the beans are good for that too. And for satiety, because they really help to keep us feeling full. Whole grains are also a good source of fiber, so things like whole wheat bread, rye bread, um, brown rice, wild rice, whole wheat pasta, rather than those white refined versions. So anytime you can get the whole grain instead of the refined grain, that's also going to increase the fiber intake. And nutrition as well, B vitamins and iron too. If you feel like these are foods that you don't think you're going to be get, able to get enough of in your diet, then that's where we might consider a fiber supplement. But at any time you consider taking a supplement of any kind, you want to make sure that you're double checking that with your doctor for a recommendation because there can be other things in those supplements too. Here is a nice list um, of high fiber foods. So what you'll notice, the foods I was just talking about, so lots of um, fruits and vegetables and beans and peas and whole grains. And if you'll notice about, I tried to highlight this about in the middle of the screen, just one cup of most sorts of beans like lentils or black beans have about 15 grams of fiber. Our recommendation is at least 25 grams of fiber in a day. If you ate a whole cup and you had 15 grams all at one time, you might not feel that great with that portion because that's a lot all at once. So I might say have a half cup of beans as part of your meal rather than you know larger portions. But certainly if you can handle it, it's fine. That would just be giving you an example of some foods that are pretty high in fiber. Even the artichoke, you wouldn't think about that. One medium artichoke has 10 grams of fiber. Our recommendation is to have at least two pieces of fruit a day, at least a couple cups of vegetables a day, um, and then make sure that most of your grains are whole grain. Um, I do also recommend having beans like the dried beans two or three times a week you can add them to soups to salads to rice dishes to pasta dishes I add um, black beans to ground um, turkey and just make a black bean burger out of it it's really easy and gives it another flavor so there are a lot of good uh, different ways to get this fiber in on the topic of hydration so to go along with this fiber as we're increasing fiber we're increasing water one reason to increase the water is, of course, to, to move the food through. Another reason is that we want to make sure to have enough fluid volume so that we're not having low blood pressure. So if we're not, if we're dehydrated, if we're getting into a situation where, where, where we're dehydrated, our blood pressure may start to fall and then we can start to feel dizzy. And if we start to feel dizzy, then that increases our chance of falling and having fractures and things like that. So we want to make sure that we're not dehydrated. We actually start to be dehydrated as soon as we start to feel thirsty. So it's important not to get to that place. So to make sure that you're drinking water with your meals and also between your meals so you're not feeling thirsty throughout the day. Now some medications can cause that feeling of dry mouth and so drinking water throughout the day can certainly help with that side effect. Our recommendation for water, this is a general recommendation again, about six to eight eight ounce glasses a day. That would be 48 to 64 ounces of water throughout the day and just kind of drinking that throughout again with meals, between meals. We do want to limit caffeine. So this affects people a little differently individually. Sometimes caffeine can be dehydrating. So we like to see you have no more than about 16 ounces of caffeinated beverage in a day. Um, if you drink coffee or tea, you might even consider switching over to a decaf or at least a half calf. If you had a decaf coffee or decaf tea, that would count as water, actually. That would count into that 48 to 64 ounces of water. Now, if you're very active, so you're doing your exercise and you're active, you may even need more water than this. So you can kind of let your um, kind of symptoms be your guide for that. Are you feeling very thirsty um, and that sort of thing. 
Speaking of bone health, so we're talking about decreasing risk of having falls and fractures, we want to make sure that we're optimizing our bone density, that we're decreasing risk for osteoporosis and fractures, which um, we are at increased risk for, for with Parkinson's. Prevention is really the key here. Making sure that you're not smoking, that's a good, you know, preventable risk factor. Um, making sure that you're not taking in excess alcohol, which we wouldn't recommend doing anyway. Um, and then making sure that you're staying as active as possible so that you're doing some weight bearing and exercise. That can be very helpful too with reducing the risk for osteoporosis. And then dietarily, we want to make sure to get enough calcium, magnesium, and vitamin D into our diet. We'll talk about um, some food sources of those various nutrients. The recommendation for calcium in adults 50 and over is 1,200 milligrams per day. Does anyone have an idea about how many servings of food high calcium we would have to have to meet that need? About four, about four servings per day. Okay, so we really have to kind of focus on doing that because a lot of people sort of fall short on that. Um, adults under 50, we recommend about 1,000 milligrams of calcium per day. So this is a nutrient where as we get older, we actually need more of it because we don't absorb it as well. So our, our needs continue to increase for calcium. Food sources of calcium include um, our dairy foods, milk, yogurt, and cheese, and we do recommend having the reduced fat versions of these foods, also keeping heart health in mind. Dark green vegetables, fortified cereals, and even fortified orange juice. So if you drink a little orange juice, you know, in the morning, for example, then maybe have the calcium fortified orange juice. That's an easy way to get some extra calcium in. And even the almond milk and soy milk does have calcium and vitamin D added to it. So those can be some good options as well. If you can feel like you're not going to be able to take in this much calcium from foods, this will be another situation where you might discuss a calcium supplement with your physician. With magnesium, magnesium helps to rebuild and strengthen bones. Just as calcium, um, there's a lot of calcium in the dark green vegetables, there's also magnesium in the dark green vegetables. The beans, the nuts, the peas, the whole grains also are a great source of magnesium. The recommendation on magnesium is to have about 320 to 420 milligrams per day. Unfortunately, this is not um, required to be included on food labels, so it can be hard to track how much magnesium am I, am I getting. So I don't really recommend having to do that, just trying to include include, again, a variety of these foods in your diet throughout the week. Vitamin D helps us to absorb calcium, so it's very important that we make sure to get enough vitamin D in our diet. Um, it's not known as the sunshine vitamin, so when the ultraviolet light, uh, rays hit our skin, then vitamin D is produced. This process also um, doesn't work as efficiently as we get older, so sometimes we do have to end up resorting to a, a vitamin D supplement. However, there are some food sources that provide us with some vitamin D, so fortified milk um, or milk substitutes, like again, the almond milk or the soy milk, fortified cereal, fatty fish like salmon, and we'll talk about salmon in a little while too about another benefit with that, other than it's a good protein source, but salmon, tuna, mackerel, those types of fatty fish, um, beef, liver, egg yolks, all of those foods give us some vitamin D as well. So it's good to eat a variety of those foods. And again, if you feel like you're not going to get enough vitamin D in your diet, then you would consult your physician for a, um, a supplement. This is something that I feel like is being tested more frequently anymore. And we are finding that a lot of people are low in vitamin D actually. So that, that's a lab test that's frequently done anymore. Um, and so we do see people taking some of the, the vitamin D supplements, but um, you always want to do that with the direction of your physician. The topic of weight management. So when we're talking about weight management here, I mentioned earlier, we can either be talking about weight loss or weight gain. A variety of factors can affect our weight management. If we're feeling nauseated, obviously it's hard to get the, the calories in that we need. So we need to think about, about that. Decreased appetite. So we might have decreased appetite because of nausea or even because of mood changes. That can happen too. Um, increased energy needs. So if we're having tremors, for example, then we might have increased calorie needs and need to make sure maybe we add a snack between meals where we weren't having that before just to keep up our weight. And then swallowing problems. Certainly we can see this happen with Parkinson's and we want to consider that. Such some strategies to help with that if that would happen. Having consistent small meals and snacks throughout the day is a great idea. We recommend this um, for anyone just to eat small meals, kind of graze throughout the day rather than eating very large portions that we have trouble utilizing all at one time. So small meals and snacks. If you have nausea and you sit down to a big plate of food, sometimes you, that will make your nausea worse, um, just looking at that big amount of food. So just having small portions can really help. If you have decreased appetite, eating something small but more frequent can help um, with that too. So just kind of trying to spread those calories out throughout the day. 
Eating soft foods with sauces added can help with swallowing difficulty. So if we had something like chicken, we might want to slow cook that chicken in some broth rather than maybe grilling it or frying it and having that would, might make a, a more of a difficulty with the swallowing. Um, just like vegetables, having um, soft cooked vegetables rather than raw vegetables might be helpful with this as well. If you're finding that you're doing, um, having a lot of problems with swallowing, it might be a good idea to ask your physician about um, a consult with a speech therapist so that they can evaluate that and come up with some techniques for you too to help with that process. Slowing down when you're eating. This is something that we always recommend, just slowing down and being more mindful when you're eating. So that can certainly um, help with decreasing any of those problems with swallowing that you might be experiencing. And then we talked earlier about taking medication with a little bit of food if that medication can cause some nausea and then that can help you to be able to feel like eating. With weight gain, sometimes we will see this. We can either have the issue of compulsive eating or sometimes related to mood or sometimes medication can maybe make us feel more hungry and so we're more likely to eat larger portions than what we're used to. Certainly we want to make sure that you're staying active, absolutely, but sometimes if you're not as able to be quite as active as you were before, that change in activity where you don't eat as many calories but you're eating the same amount of food can result in some weight gain. I think mindfulness helps with this a lot, just like it helps with the swallowing difficulty, chewing food thoroughly. One strategy that I use at home, and I don't have to really think about doing this, is putting my utensil down between bites. So putting your utensil down between bites really makes you stop and think that there's food in my mouth, I need to chew it thoroughly, I'm actually enjoying it more because I'm not eating so quickly. And you start to realize when you're becoming full, where if we're eating too fast, we don't realize we're starting to get full until we've eaten too much and then we don't feel so good. And we want to lay down and take a nap. So it's a good idea to kind of put that utensil down, really just kind of focus on the meal. I try not to have the cell phone around or the TV on also during a meal so that we're really thinking about what we're doing. And that can help um, also, again, slow down, eat a small portion, um, and help with that swallowing difficulty too. Some research topics to consider. Coffee is being looked at as having an in inverse relationship um, between Parkinson's disease and coffee in men. And so there's not a set recommendation for this right now. It's being studied, maybe um, offering some neuroprotective benefits. And so there's still more research that needs done on this. And then also green and black tea can possibly also be neuroprotective. The recommendation on that is maybe to have a couple cups of tea each day. There are antioxidants in the tea too that are really healthy just for for general good health. And I put um, the little asterisks over there, decaf, you know, we wanna make sure if you can switch over to the decaf, certainly that will help your hydration. Um, so having some coffee or tea, but the decaf or at least the half calf uh, would be the best idea. Omega-3 fatty acids, also um, some studies are showing that they can be neuroprotective. They're also a good um, anti-inflammatory food, which can help with heart disease, even arthritis. Things like the salmon, the tuna, the mackerel that we talked about earlier, herring, canola oil, flaxseed. I put this uh, ground flaxseed in parentheses because it's already, um, it's already been broken down a bit, so it's easier for our bodies to utilize than the whole flaxseed itself. Chia seeds and also walnuts. So all of those provide us with some omega-3 fatty acids. We recommend having fish at least a couple times a week, so two or three times a week if you like it well enough um, it would be a great idea. It's also a lean protein source. Just kind of alternating that in with chicken and turkey and lean pork and lean beef, so kind of eating a variety. And then fruits and vegetables, I really can't say enough about these. Uh, we talk about these in every class that we teach really, um, the positive benefit of having enough fruits and vegetables in our diet. So again, having at least a couple pieces of fruit a day, eat a variety. I like to eat seasonally um, because that encourages variety, but um, also having at least a couple cups of vegetables in a day. We like to see people fill half their plate full of vegetables at dinner, for example, and then kind of balance the other half between your protein and maybe some type of, of whole grain. Fruits and vegetables, they are high in antioxidants. They also have a lot of phytochemicals in them that can be healthy just for a general healthy diet. And our studies that are showing that they can possibly help with slowing the progression of Parkinson's. So certainly that's a big benefit. Um, and, and yeah, just try to eat a variety throughout the year. So in summary, we want to make sure that we're eating a variety of fruits and vegetables, having whole grains rather than refined grains. So the recommendation is that at least half of your grains come from whole grain sources. So even more, um, more than that would be better. So you know, just make sure that the majority of those grains are whole grains. You're getting a great nutrition and also fiber from those. And then we do want to make sure to have the low-fat dairy. Again, our recommendation for anyone 50 or older is 1,200 milligrams per day. Calcium is currently on the food label, so you can easily see how much calcium 
calcium is in a food. Um, vitamin D is not, but it's going to be added. So we have a new food label coming out finally, and we're really excited about that. So it'll show you how much vitamin D is in your foods as well, so it's easier to track. And then consuming fish at least a couple times a week gives us those omega-3 fatty acids that can be neuroprotective possibly and also um, anti-inflammatory. And staying well hydrated. So just, I carry a water bottle with me throughout the day because otherwise I don't think about it until I'm starting to feel a dry mouth. And then that again is our first sign of dehydration. So just carrying it with you, whatever you have with you, you'll see it, you'll probably drink it. So um, go ahead and carry that if you're out and about or even just around home is a good idea. I try to fill up a glass of water before I even leave the house. So I put it on the kitchen counter and I just make sure it's gone before I leave the house. So that gives me about 16 ounces because it's a big glass um, right off the bat. And then consider drinking some tea for that neuroprotective um, benefit and also for the antioxidants that, that you have in the tea. These are some resources for Parkinson's that you might find helpful. So there are some websites here, also a couple of books. One of the websites is nutritionyoucanlivewith.com, Parkinson, parkinson.org, and then there's a forum on parkinson.org as well. And a couple of books by Katherine Holden, who is a registered dietitian, and those books are Eat Well, Stay Well with Parkinson's Disease and Cook Well, Stay Well with Parkinson's Disease. So these are some really great resources that you can access, either on the computer or you could go to the library and look up the books too and find them there or to a bookstore if you don't really use the computer that much necessarily. Any questions? Um, any of the topics that we've discussed today? Or anything else? Yes. How do you exercise your intestines? By eating fiber. <laughs> so eating plenty of fiber and also fluid so that the fiber moves through. And actually, honestly, also just exercise itself um, can help with relieving constipation. So just making sure that you're staying active throughout the day. Yes. One thing that I do before I go out to eat, first of all, whatever restaurant it is, is I look up the menu and the nutrition information. And I try to go to the light menu or the 500 calorie menu because those are smaller portions by about at least half. Um, so I would say that I don't choose a specific restaurant necessarily, but I'll look up m information or wait till I get to the restaurant and look on the light menu or go to lunch instead of dinner so you're getting a smaller portion. And then just try a few things that I recommend kind of trying to stay away from when you're out to eat um, are fried foods, cheese, and creamy sauces. Those three things, um, because those really aren't going to give us good nutrition, just a lot of extra calories and fat that aren't that healthy. So trying to have grilled alternatives, so grilled chicken or baked fish, and just making sure to have um, some vegetables. Another thing that I recommend with eating out is just trying to limit your starchy foods to one type of starchy food. So instead of having pasta with bread, having pasta with salad, or salad with bread. You know, So um, just trying to kind of cut down on those starchy portions when you eat out. And so that we're getting those vegetables in still. Fish I think is a great idea to eat when you're out because a lot of people don't like to make it at home because they don't like the smell of fish at home or they're not sure how to prepare it and so I would say that would be a good option too if you like that. It does have a lot of omega-3 fatty acids in that um, and it is a fatty fish but it's a good type of fat that we want to have that again can possibly be neuro neuroprotective and also anti-inflammatory for us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? Mm -hmm.